You've heard the stories from our season. We've talked about our strategies, what worked and what didn't. So now it's your turn. The questions have been rolling into the Elk Bros mailbox. So it's time to have the show topics come from you, our grinders. And tonight's questions cover all kinds of topics. How we select a hunt unit, calling during the rifle season, a game plan for flat country, changing your call to sound different, selecting reads, questioning your guide, what to do with a bull going away, and much more. Strap it on, y'all. It's going to be one for the books. So, my friends, pull up a chair, adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkBros.com, with your host, Gilbert Ornelas, and elk hunting coach, Joe Gilly. You want to hunt elk? They live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hello there, everyone. If it's your first time with us, glad to have you. Hope you enjoy our show. And as always, for those blue collar hunters following our show and grinding it out with us every week, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas, the host of your show, coming to you from Spring, Texas, and from Katy in the Dallas, Fort Worth, Metroplex area. We've got the leaders of the Venezuelan mafia, Luis Gonzalez and Manano Graterona. That sounds worse. And from Cimarron, <laughs> New Mexico. That's right, your elk hunting coaches are in the house. We've got the ninja, Leroy Chavez, in the house with us. Hola. And we have the legend, the man, the myth, the legend, R.C. Knox is sitting right next to WWJG. What would Joe Gillia do in the house? Oh, my gosh, fellas. Good looking group crew tonight. What's up, fellas? <laughs> I, was, I was telling Joe he doesn't look too good when he sits right next to RC, man. Well, but I but I placed myself right in between all you guys, so it's getting better all the time. Man. <laughs> oh, oh, it's getting better every day. But... Just make sure when you edit the podcast, you, yeah. you put Manano right next to you. I'm, I'm, I'm like pushing you guys out, man. Just <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Uh, I thought I'd make everybody happy with the leaders of the Venice. Beto, honestly, Beto, that sounds crazy, man. <laughs> honestly, that, that was horrible, Beto. Oh, man. let's do it again. No, no, man, we can't do it again because RC got double legend tonight. Uh, yeah. You got double legend. Double legend. legend. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, and we got two leaders. One in the world. <laughs> oh, please, Beto. Yeah, Manana agrees that there should be only one and it should be me. So hey, no, you got the word right. Let's well, talk about what's important. Let's talk about what's important, guys. And Joe, let's talk. The successes keep rolling in. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> The success yeah. stories are rocking, you know, they, they, they just keep coming in. If people are checking yeah. out our Instagram, we're posting pictures up there. I can't get them on there fast enough. You know, I'm only doing like three per day it is just so cool to hear. And if you look at where these people are coming from, I oh, mean, yeah. all over the United States, they're coming from, you know, the Midwest States are coming from the East States. we got guys over in the Western States. Um, in fact, I'm going to give a shout out to some of those right now. Uh, and I loved this town because Chav said, this is one that we haven't heard, man. Jared Russell out of. No, that, that was, that was with me, Joe. Let me, let me do it because this oh, guy just okay. killed a big bull. Uh -huh. And then he goes like, I'm going to quote. <laughs> so he said so many well, things, gonna, but the most important thing, right now, right? <laughs> he goes like, P.S., the leader of the Venezuelan mafia has always been and will always be Manano. So, Jared, I saw that on Instagram, man. Jared, this is a big shout out to my friend Jared Russell, Leslie, Missouri. Yo, Thank Manana, you, bro. So I agree, man. So, two things, brother. One, it's like, you know, you got to understand nobody's perfect. OK, <laughs> two, uh, you, you also need to, you know, really just work on those relationships with a very few and far in between that actually think that way. That's so the I'm, thing. I'm that's the thing. I don't to need to try to grow you know, that audience because, you know, uh, yeah, there are very few guys the out there. So, that's the difference. That, that is a big difference. I don't build arrow for nobody. 
you build arrow for your followers. So they follow you. Exactly. And they say something or things about you because there is an underlying reason. Oh. <laughs> I, don't, I don't communicate with these guys. It's just a, like a natural feeling. I, I don't know, man. You know, I, you, go you, ahead, Joe. You might have done some legal favor somewhere down the line. No, I don't. Do, I don't. I charge. I charge for, I charge for legal favors. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. And I shouldn't be doing arrows for you either. So I'm going to stop doing that. <laughs> so. So Jared <laughs> Russell, and, and, and you're right, Manano, it was a beautiful bull that he got. Yeah, um, definitely. In fact, I believe, I think that's his, is it his second year? I think you're right, yes. Bull, right? Like yes. That, oh, and, and if you guys didn't see the one that Dalton Heredia got from oh, Laramie yeah. Wyoming. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was a yeah. monster. Beautiful bull. freaking Big monster one. bulls coming Big through, you know, and, and, and yeah, I, congrats to Jared. Awesome, awesome kill, man. And, and Joe, Dalton, I, I, I got to say, you know, I've been following a bunch of this on Instagram and everything. Uh -huh. I saw one on a Phelps post where it was two females that left their husbands at home, there brother. And they were like, the husband stayed at home with the kids. We went up there and they knocked two bulls down, man. There you go. Stuff. That was one of the coolest posts I've seen. From Show them the, how it's done, right? Yeah, man. Yep. Two females up there getting it done in the back country. It, they they hiked in like eight miles, dude, to go into the back country. It was a really cool story. And on the opposite end of that, I saw one on the Got Game Tech uh, post that was, I mean, this kid had to have been, I don't know, 13 or 14. I didn't see his age. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I saw that one. Yeah. That spike bull with, with a rifle, bull. right? Uh, I believe it was. And it had that spike bull, right? And I mean... The smile on uh, that young man's face, oh, it yeah. was priceless. Yeah, you know, you. that's exactly why we do what we do <laughs> to see those kind of memories and stuff. And I mean, that post, I mean, I've been posting a lot of stuff and I'm really proud of what I'm hearing from all of our followers out there. We get Definitely. the coolest stuff. But when I see things like that, it just really <laughs> rocks the world. And, and Dalton, um, you know, was so cool what Dalton said was because, you know, he in the past, he's taken a few cows, uh, but he says he's always struggled to be an elk. He's, you know, he's been a listener now for a while. He's followed us stuff. He, and he says, it's changed everything. He said, I'm in elk all the time, you know, and now I truly believe I can kill an elk on any day. And that's, that's what we want. That's what, yeah, we want. what, what I think too, Joe, is that uh, what's cool to see is that the, the way that the podcast is set up and the delivery Mm -hmm. is is actually making it to we can see people assimilating the content you know it's just the way it's being delivered it's being well received and people are able to actually apply it in the field and it's just cool to see those stories come through because then it, okay well it makes sense it, it seems like the way we're putting it out there is 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 properly being absorbed yeah and finding well, success out there yeah no doubt. no i mean it's been crazy good uh and look, I, I think overall the bow hunting, uh, the bow hunting September, the month of September was tough on a lot of hunters. Sure. Oh yeah. But we had first timers. We had people killing their first elk ever out there. <laughs> Absolutely. Getting it done, and you know the the story of I'm going to give a shout out to Scott Winter, and Scott did yeah. not kill a bull. Yeah. But listen to this story because I was getting texts from Scott, and Scott's like holy geez man what do i gotta do he's like i call him into 30 yards and i miss he said yeah i'm, I'm having no trouble now getting out <clears throat> i just got to be able to shoot one he's yeah. and and he really started to doubt himself and he was like you know mm -hmm. and i told him like that's enough of that go out there kill an elk. you know go sure. with a positive mindset <laughs> well he was struggling so much that he came across another hunter out there gary hansen and mm -hmm. I, I wish I could have been the bird on the tree listening to this, but he, he gets with Gary and he says, and he tells me, he says, Gary could shoot. I could call. We made it happen. <laughs> <laughs> hey, when you know, you know, brother. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, oh, so he ends up going out and calling in a bull for Gary Hansen and Gary yeah. kills this bull. <clears throat> and so they tag team two guys who had never hunted together, put together skill sets out there on public land and right. got it done. And, you know, it's so cool because Scott 
has always been a solid listener. He's just a solid supporter and, and asking question after question. And, and I think, you know, there were, when he first started this, there was a lot of doubts and stuff, those doubts, man, that dude Um, is making it happen now. So uh, it's really, really cool to see, man. And you were hunting too, just recently, right? Yeah. I went on a mule deer hunt with your son, with my son. Yeah. Yeah. It was so uh, cool. Yeah, it was a good hunt. It was a muzzleloader hunt. Oh, smoke so, stick. Uh, yeah, smoke stick. Yes, sir. Was it a smoke stick or was it one of them hot inlines, man? Well, yeah, of <laughs> course it was one of them inlines. Yeah, it wasn't a flintlock, Joe. But it still <laughs> smokes. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're going, did I hit him? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. How far was your shot? Uh, about 165. Dang, that's a good shot with a oh, muzzleloader. Yeah. yeah. For sure, man. How far was Lee's? Uh, his was almost two. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I've, I've seen yours. Out. I didn't get to see Lee's, but I saw your beautiful buck. Beautiful yeah. buck. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful New Mexico. Oh, he's going to be a, he's going to make a beautiful mount. I can't wait to get him mounted. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. yeah that's, Congratulations, I, brother. Well, well, thank you. Yeah, you know, just to be out there with Lee. That's... Well, that was the main thing for me is, uh, and it was for Lee too. He he told the, the guy that we were with, he said, I don't care about getting one. I just want my dad to get one. <coughs> so that yeah. really made a, a big difference there, you know, so. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, just, and, you know, I've known Lee since he was knee high to a grasshopper. Just a boy. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's so cool to see him grow into the man that he is and then yeah. him being able to be out there with his dad and stuff. And, Definitely. you know, you've had uh I, I I don't know. You've got a little hop to your step this year, man. I, I've seen you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Hey, man, I'm telling you, we we pushed it like wild men the last few days on that mountain, dude. I'm straight up. I'm, I needed a couple of days to recoup after that because I'm telling you, I was sore all over. But, I mean, it was I, worth it. I, I had such a good time hunting with RC. And, I did, too. Uh, I was yeah. laughing at Cole because, he, you know, I had to wear those knee braces. Yeah. And uh, about second to third day, especially when we come off the hill with your elk, you know, he goes, Yes. I think you're just putting on a show. I don't think those are really. For- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Go, yeah my, my knees are going to give out. No, I don't think so. You, you know. Yeah. So well, that's what they good. don't know is I've known you for 12 years and you were hunting with knee braces the first time I met you. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. For, for real. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, uh, we all, you know, like Brendan. I mean, Brendan screwed his foot up first day, oh, you know, yes. and, and actually had a fracture in it. And uh, oh, did he really? Yeah. Yeah. He ended up with a fracture, fracture in the wow. foot. Yeah. Luckily, Man, and he, he and he up. helped me, you know, carry my elk down the mountain with that fractured right. uh, mm-hmm. ankle. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, somebody had to do something because Manano didn't want to help, man. So it was like, oh yeah, especially yeah. they carry the one, you know, one ham and one shoulder and plus the lomo. He was such, such a, such a baby. I mean, I'm Cole. glad Cole was there to show him yeah, much, but, uh, what was up. I will let Cole out, dude. I, 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 got I, <laughs> I, I got it on video. I got it on video. I got to ask one question: Who who was in the lead when you guys came off the mountain with with Gilbert? I was. Yeah. See. Uh, I'm sorry, but I you, was. He, well, so, he took you to the roughest place there possibly. Well, that's could. what I was going to say. They left <laughs> 45 minutes before us, right. and we got there three minutes behind them. Behind them. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know where they. By went. the time you guys got there, we not only had already put the meat in there, we almost shot another cow. <laughs> hey, well, look, you know me. I, I'm one speed, four wheel drive, and low. low gear. So I had to go slow, man. I mean, I had a whole whole pack full of daggum lomo and neck meat that thing was heavy jack coming down that was some that was some rough country man joe joe told me the other day rc he goes oh dude he said we went up through that stuff for you and rc went oh my god gilbert he said kudos to y'all man because that ain't that ain't no joke getting up down through there you know absolutely not man When, when i was up there i was like you know, hat props, man, props to those guys because up here is not an it's a hike. Yeah, it's a hike. Look at you know, RC and I knew it was gonna be that way. 
But at the end of the day, we knew the elk were up there. So, heck, if we started out early enough, we knew we'd make it up there by midday. <laughs> you know. So, so big O. Yes, sir. Uh, tell us what time it is, because, brother, we got a lot to get through tonight. Sounds good. Guys, y'all know what time it is. Shout it's time for the Elk Grove shout, shout out. out. If you're new to our show, this is a shout out to a few cities where most listeners topping our charts this week, Joe. And first up, man. You guys haven't heard him in a couple of weeks. So let's start our shout outs with a tip from the old uh, Billy Goat himself, <laughs> Bob Collins. Hey, Bob, what's up? Hey, guys, this is the old Billy Goat with another tip for you. This one's about sharing information. <laughs> I know you don't want to hear sharing information with other hunters, but this is different. This is sharing information with the cowboys who are trying to find their cattle up in the wilderness areas or national forest. I find by <clears> telling them where their cattle are, they will tell me where the elk they've seen are. And that's a great source of information, guys. It's firsthand. Uh, it's, it's fresh. So, guys, if you, anytime you see the cowboy out there looking for his cattle, you've seen them, let them know, guys. That's your tip from the old Billy Goat. Good luck, guys. And he, he always has really good tips. I, I'm going to yeah, tell you what. Tip. The last tip he gave us about sending those cards to the yep. family while you were gone. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, worked incredible i i i was like i'm down for that and i did it and uh yeah they they, they loved it, it family loved it yeah. oh that's awesome man yeah and i love it too yeah <laughs> you know, he said, because luis sent one to manano too didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> all right guys that sounds really good top listening cities chav you're up hey this week's number one top listening city located in St. Clair County in Michigan, received its name from Judge DeWitt Walker. In 1857, Walker, a graduate of the University of Michigan, loved Peruvian history and originally named the city Manco Capac after a Sapa Inca of the Inca Empire. The Sapa Inca was a name for the position of the sole and absolute ruler of the Inca Empire a position that was passed down from generation to generation. The Inca people believe their Sapa Inca was a direct descendant of the sun god. And this is in Michigan, so they probably pronounce this Kapak or Kapak, Michigan. We'll find out. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Kapak, Kapak, Yeah, we'll get some feet. We'll get some feet. Oh, I, I make some kin, uh, phone calls to my kinfolk up there. It's just outside of Emmett, north of North, kind of northeast out of Detroit there. So you know how to say it? No, it I'll, I'll make some phone calls with my kinfolk up there. I think it's Kapak. Kapak or Kapak. Well, yeah. um, you know, some of our listeners there, but you guys are top listeners. Let us know, man. We'd love to hear from you. And and look, and this, this is great that we had that because this whole thing about the mafia leader and all that stuff, y'all just call me Sapa. <laughs> Not Sapo. Not Sapo. Sapo. Yeah, Sapo is more like yeah. Sapo is a whistleblower. Sapo <laughs> is a whistleblower. No, 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 yeah, 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 not or, New Mexico or a frog. Yeah, well, not New Mexico. Sapo New Mexico, Mexico is yeah. like lucky, you know, lucky, like yeah. oh, floppy. Yeah, lucky. Yeah. He's at. He's yeah, lucky. Sapo. Sapo. Yeah, lucky. Yeah, guys. Yeah, next up, pay go ahead. attention to this next top listening city name. If you would like to be a veterinarian, for sure, it's known for a quality of life, and the others would want to have that. It has a small college town atmosphere with emphasis on parks and open spaces. Half of the population of the town are students of the UC Davis University. Undergraduates can earn degrees in over 100 majors, and UC Davis specializes in agriculture and is a world leader in veterinary medicine in none other than Davis, California. Davis, California. Yes, sir. California shows up tonight twice, man. Davis. That's cool. UC Davis. Yeah, I mean, world-renowned veterinarians coming out of that place. You and, bet. And I tell you what, man, you want to make uh, – that, that's that's the doctor to be right there, <laughs> a <little> vet man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Your clients don't complain, man. They just, <laughs> yeah. That's uh, that's what Sophia wants to be. Sometimes, mm. <laughs> kind of stink. 
<laughs> daughter wants to be a vet. You know, my, my, uh, my niece, uh, not, uh, my niece, Hannah, she's going to be an equine. <laughs> she was going to be a vet, an equine vet, but she's going to be an equine chiropractor, dude. Yes, they, they have that. Yeah, nowadays. they do. Yep. It's wild. Mm -hmm. I don't know, man. Getting them down on that bench and then lifting the leg, and I, that could be. <laughs> it's amazing what they do. Well, gonna I, do we we had one out the ranch the other day, and it's unbelievable. Really? You got to really? raise his leg up a certain way, and then he t takes his head around the other side, and and it's like, man, they brush their teeth and everything. I tell you what, I like to be. I I like to be an elk morgue surgeon. Oh, what? <laughs> a morgue, a morgue, 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 <laughs> <laughs> process, <laughs> process <laughs> plan. Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, up next, this city in Clickitaw County, located near the Columbia River Gorge, is primarily an agricultural area. It is known for the Goldendale Observatory State Park. Located in a valley, it offers views of the Cascade Mountains to the west and the Simcoe Hills to the north. The Little Clickitaw River flows through the town, but the main water source for the town is, and I wanted to find out where this name came from, Bloodgood Creek, an entirely spring-fed, year-round water source. And that's in Goldendale, Washington. Goldendale. 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 Washington wow. shows up again. Man, I'm telling you, West it's, Coast showing out, Joe. California, I places Washington. like that. That's because yeah, get those Washington apples that are so good. I imagine, <laughs> yeah. you know, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> could be. Luis, Luis. All right. So our next stop, listening city, it's located in the Jokanukani River. It was once named Red Bud Springs for the natural spring present in the town. The current name of the city was named after a Polish. 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 Yeah. Please. Polish. Polish. Please. Lithuanian officer. Lithuanian. Yeah, Lithuanian. Who served under George Washington in the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War. With limitations. The city has been the home and host of the Central Mississippi State Fair for over 100 years. And good Shusko, luck. Mississippi. Susco, Mississippi. How, how did you say it? Husco, Mississippi. Husco. Is it really? Husco. The K sound, sound. It's Husco. I'll be darn, man. Husco. Boy, I'll you guys. I, yeah, that was a good one, man. You know, I was looking at that, and I was looking at compact. I mean, man, there's been a tough evening, man. And and then. <laughs> yeah, Yokanukani. Yokanukani. Yokanukani, yeah. That's my honor to pronounce that. That's, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not into it. The only, <laughs> thing, the only thing I know is I know where to go if I want to go to the Central Mississippi State Fair. So that, was a, that was a tough one, Chaff. Please <laughs> don't assign me one of those, please. <laughs> don't assign me one of those. <laughs> yeah. Uh, awesome. Well, up, up next, uh, prior to English incorporation, this Orange County city was known as El Toro. This city has two large man-made lakes and a forest made up mostly of eucalyptus trees. In the early 1900s, a book written with incorrect information about the tree's commercial potential led to a flood of eucalyptus get-rich-quick ventures. So El Toro pioneer Dwight Whiting, Whiting who planted 960 acres with over 400 eucalyptus trees in the 1900s, created the man-made forest that exists today. This is in Lake Forest, California. Lake Forest, Cali. California. Cali. You gonna speed that one up a little bit, Joe, when you do the well, editing? I'd rather speak properly than pronounce horrible. <laughs> is, is anybody going to correct him how to pronounce <laughs> the name of this this leaf or this eucalyptus. tree? That he, eucalyptus. There you go. There you go. Thank you. Nope. It's yes. in Spanish. Very, very close. And the last eucalyptus. name of the gentleman, Dwight, is anybody going to correct him either? Or is this like this? <laughs> oh, it's oh, it's a proper <laughs> name. You can pronounce it as you want. Come on, Luis. <laughs> Luis? I, Luis, Arr. Luis, let me talk. Luis, to I want you to know who <laughs> corrected him the first time. 
I did lose. <laughs> hey, hey, the only thing he got right was El Toro, and he almost messed that one up too. <laughs> <laughs> so is that but is is that where the El Toro um base is there then? Oh. Because I, I know there's an El Toro, uh, I think it's a marine base, hmm. I believe, there in California. Really? I don't know. Yeah, so I was wondering hmm. if that was where that was. So, oh. and, and what's cool about that, what most listeners don't know is eucalyptus leaves are the plant, that's the only plant that pandas eat, mm-hmm. is eucalyptus. Yeah. Wait, it's not pandas. Is it no, koala bears? Ko- koala, 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 koala bears. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Koala bears. Yeah, I got my bear confused there. <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> because the pandas eat the yeah, bamboo. And pandas bamboo. eat whatever they want, brother. <laughs> Let me tell you. They call me Coach Poe on my team because I got <laughs> moves like that Poe the panda. You know? So I'm always dodging foul balls and they're like, oh, it's Coach Poe over there, Poe the panda. <laughs> You know, I, I thought they called you that because you used to be a police officer, Coach <laughs> Poe. <laughs> Coach Poe. <laughs> but you know, I wondered if because this is this major forest of eucalyptus mm-hmm. here, I wonder how many of the zoos across the United States get leaves from this area there. Because I mean, where else do you get eucalyptus leaves? I mean, you got to have them brought in, right? So I, would, I don't know. We got we got a we got a ton in some areas in Venezuela. As a matter of fact, they actually taint the uh, river waters, and oh, it looks man. like tea. You know, really? I was lo- I was looking it up, Joe, and it is on the banks. the The town Lake Forest is on the banks of Lake <clears throat> Tahoe. Oh, it's, okay. It's in California, yeah. but. The, you know, state line runs straight through the middle of the lake. Mm-hmm. So Lake it, Lake Tahoe is split between Nevada and California, and Lake Forest is on the west side of the lake in California. I guess in my mind, the, I guess in my mind, I thought it would be too cold there for a eucalyptus tree, yeah, but yeah. maybe not, man. That's, it's it's hot country there too. We learn you something every leave day, leave man. Learn something every first. day. So we're going to get into our content, guys. And and for those people that don't think we get into our content too fast, we're Freaking getting after up. it, man. We're Absolutely. rocking and rolling because we're we're digging into the Elk Rose mailbox. We have a lot of cool things that are coming out here. So I'm going to start out first with Aaron Hughes from Fountain Green, Utah. And Aaron says, I enjoy your guys' podcasts as I listen to on my way to and from work, which is about one and a half to two hours one way. Here in Utah lately, they've been trying to pass a bill to not allow you to use trail cameras. What are your guys' take on this? And and before we even go into Utah, I believe they've already passed or yeah, or are passing something like that in Arizona as well. But Arizona has a little bit different situation. And what's happening in Arizona, let's compare and you know, separate the two. What's happening in Arizona is, you know, it's desert country. They have all of these created water holes. Right. And so mm-hmm. there'll be a tree by a water hole. And there is literally 12, 15 cameras cameras on one tree. Is that or they drive us still uh, close in the ground and, yeah. Yeah, and put all the cameras there. And so what you have is people will be in a blind and people come in to check their cameras or people, you know, mm-hmm. there's. And, and really what's happening is it's not so much that the cameras are giving anybody this advantage. Mm. Um, it's that there are conflicts between people. Over I'm sure. And, and probably cameras stolen too, where people uh, are creating a lot of work for law enforcement as well. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's that that's one of the things in Arizona, but now let's take a look at Utah and trail cameras and, and I don't know, how do you guys feel about not being able to use trail cameras? I would say on public land, it might be the thing to do if they're having trouble. But on private land, it shouldn't, have, shouldn't matter. Absolutely. You should be able to use trail cameras anytime on your private ranch. Yeah. You know, I don't want bit. somebody taking away my liberties you know, yeah. tell me what I can do, what I can't do on my own ranch. And I, I think he might be, and I'm not sure, but he might be also asking about, you know, our thoughts about the use. Yeah. So using the trail cam, is that impacting your success on harvesting an elk? Should. Yes or no? Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. I've, I've never know. owned one. I've never used one. I know Carl used them all the time on yeah. his place. Um, Loved it. Uh, 
and and it was great to be able to show clients animals that were coming in and out i know a lot of people use trail cams during the summer and then they get hugely disappointed a lot because where they're seeing i was gonna say they're yeah. amazing as long as the data is not too outdated you know you may have some good information on a trail cam but they're an amazing management tool we use them tremendously down here in <clears throat> yeah. south texas on our whitetail herds and our pigs and but are they um, using as management tools on public land elk hunting? Is that what? No, doing? well, you don't right. have a management program on public right. land elk, uh, other than like right. Colorado, where you got four, you got to have four uh, points on one side or a five inch brow time. I mean, those are the only kind of management things that they're using them for. But private ranches use them all the time to identify mature bulls versus uh, middle aged bulls versus young bulls. Right. We had a we had a deal there on that private ranch where Carl was is that we couldn't find the elk what happened to all the elk they just yeah. disappeared well guess what on the camera mm, exactly a big cat that was a mountain lion. Big, oh yeah big yeah. mountain lion yeah i got him on i've got a picture of it yeah. uh and I'll, I'll send it to joe and he can put it on so everybody can see that picture of that mountain lion chasing get brendan fight. out there take care of the issue <laughs> <laughs> that's a big cat too <laughs> brother yeah. if, oh, if i remember cool. correctly that cat almost looked like a ghost image behind oh yes chasing it, right? exactly yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's, yes, it's at full speed chasing this elk the elk looks scared out of its oh, gourd yeah. man running yeah. away but you know at the 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 one thing that i go back to is is like this season is we had chav sitting at a wallop in his yep. blind and because chav was there he was almost a camera for us and he was like you know, you we're really? going, well, there's no elk in the area. We done walked all through here. And Chad's like, uh, no, I saw. I, I saw, saw 20. This. You know, I, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I think that's. I've seen 20 that's, elk and we're like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> the one thing that it can do is just confirm whether or not you've got some animals moving in an area. Yeah. I mean, I, I mm -hmm. could see that where that. But you can be. still gather some of that information based on sign. Sure. Sure. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh man there's nothing like that picture to see them sometimes too and 100 uh, percent. and i'll tell you an, another way that some people are beginning to use those cameras is that they are using them to keep an eye on their camp or on their vehicle or something exactly, like that yeah you know? so mm -hmm. um they're using them more for security yeah but then at that moment is you know you can get technical about it you can call it a camp camera not a trail camera yeah well yeah <laughs> it might be legal then well, so I know what, what are, a lot of what, guys are using. But I know how does this work, always, man. Always making things complicated. Hey, hey I thought you were the lawyer, it. man. I thought you were the lawyer. You should, you should be able to kind of we figure this out. We resolve issues, don't we? Don't make issues. That's what I mean. We're resolving <laughs> it by calling it a cam camera versus a trail camera. So I, I guess my word, yeah. uh, my question is: Are game cams a necessity for us as elk hunters to no, be it's successful? It's not a necessity. It's a luxury. Okay. It's not a necessity. I, I, I would say it's a nice to have versus a need to have, yeah. Joe. If right. if you would ask me, I mean, not you know the way we've been hunting elk the last six years, I don't think we've ever used a trail cam. Mm -mm. Yeah. Mm -mm. No, but we sure could. I mean, there's nothing wrong with putting them on wallows or you know water horse sources and seeing what time that the elk are visiting them. You know, uh, it can help you, especially yeah. like. You know, when Chav wasn't sitting in the blind, if you'd have set a trail cam up there, you'd have known what was there when he wasn't in the blind. You know what That's I mean? That's true. Yeah. I, I, I just, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's a pro, if it's a con. I don't worry about it too much, but I do know it gets people out in the woods. It gets mm -hmm. people active. Um, it gets point. them into, you know, out in the country. They, um, they go with buddies, friends, kids, different things like that. So I, I think actually trail cams to me are, are almost more of a hobby and an opportunity to see animals almost just like going out and, you know, doing photography or something. Yeah. Like that. Well, I think it's a great management tool. I think it can be used for good things. Mm -hmm. And then there's no doubt that it's probably starting some riffraff amongst guys that are either vandalizing uh, the trail cams that are out there, which is causing a ton of work for unnecessary crap work for, you know, law enforcement. And then also, like you said, they're driving T hundred T posts around a dead gum walla Water. You know, for everybody's mm -hmm. new trail cam. So I could, I could understand States not wanting trail cam uses on pub on uh public land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Now, but I wouldn't um, want them taking my right away from using it on private. Yeah, I know. I, I hear you on that. So um, the only thing is <laughs> I messed up on this next question uh, because I didn't, I, I got the name in there and yeah. I, forgot to, I forgot to actually put the question in there. So I'm oh. going to, I'm going to do that right away. Sorry, Manano. I missed. Yeah, it's good. It, we're better off skipping Manano anyway. <laughs> <laughs> His question it worked was. Worked out for the best. His question was, when doing a cold calling sequence to try and find elk, is there such a thing as too much intensity in calling? In other words, too much calling or um, bugling too loud um, or too long of a calling sequence is his question. And just so that people understand what a cold calling sequence is, is basically when you haven't had a response from an animal, you're there, you're just going out and trying to get a rise out of something. You've seen sign, you've caught a smell, you're on a trail, you're doing those types of things. And so you're doing a scenario, what we call painting a picture to try to bring an animal from a certain area, even though you have not heard an animal. So his question is, is there such thing as too much intensity in calling um, too much bugling too loud or too long of a calling sequence. Who wants to take that first? I. All right, go ahead, man. So as far as in intensity and as far as loudness, it depends in my mind. Um, as far as the frequency, um, I don't think it, it has that much of an impact. But the, What do you mean by depends? The, so it depends on what? Yeah, it depends of the situation, the you know, if, year. yeah, and then it also, you know, one, one example to this year, when you, when that bull was coming in, Joe, and, and you kind of threw, threw a bugle at, at this young, <laughs> at this young bull there coming straight at you, Hades scare out. the crap out of him, right? I mean, so, I mean, that, there was that, that one moment, that intensity, <laughs> And loudness uh, really didn't work out for the best, right? And, yeah, but that uh, wasn't a cold calling situation, though. No, no, no. That, that no. Bull was actively, dynamically fixing the run, Joe. Over. Yeah, but I think to your point of the time of the year too, yeah. and yeah. kind of, you know, where the elk are at, and and how mm -hmm. silent they are, and mm -hmm. depending on, say, this year for us, we we noticed we noticed that the population of elk was relatively young, yep. so. Kind of early in the game, we realized that maybe the, the aggressive big bull type bugles weren't the best approach. And we kind of went with the, you know, more location type, uh, you know, bugles and stuff like yeah, that. A younger sound so, because yep. it matched the environment of the situation of, yes. of the age class, yes. saying, right? And I think that you hit you hit in the nail there. It's like matching the environment and kind of understanding the mood of the animals is important for you to decide the intensity mm -hmm. and the volume and the aggressiveness of your calls. And I think I think it really boils down to that. You don't want to be, you know, the guy in the in the store screaming, uh, in the in the ice cream store screaming potatoes. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Who, who says that? You're quoting somebody there. there yes. Was, I've heard yes. that. I've heard that analogy a lot of times. From <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, uh, that's, uh, what's his name? Um, well, I've uh, heard, I've, I've heard Mike say it. I've heard, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah Mike, Mike Michael, with, uh, uh, Michael Batiste. I've heard him say it. And I've heard, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I've I heard, heard Joe saying, that. but, but I want to take you back to a, a <laughs> <laughs> one of the things, one of the things, Joey, and I can tell you is from from this year when RC and I were calling, um, you know, we always elevated the the cold call. Right? It was always starting off something real slow and methodical and being a lover, more realistic, a fighter, more realistic, and then introducing so introducing a bull, <laughs> right, with a cow, right, and and then getting him wound up. Right. Uh, Cause usually when bulls feel like there's another hot cow there, they may leave even cows that aren't in heat, you know what I mean? Uh, and come over. So we did a lot of that. And once we got a, a response, then we elevated uh, everything, but man, I'm telling you, I bet our sequences RC lasted 45 minutes, you know, At sure. least, I mean, they yeah, were, they I was going to say a that. long time. Yeah. That last one that we called in, I mean, you know, yeah. we never did, you never did get to get, real high i mean it was still no, just cow calling and everything so, else. so it was 
coming so, big time. So people yeah. can understand though, you know, and get an idea of what's going on. You know, when you're doing your calls about, about how long are you doing a series of calls and what kind of break are you putting in between them when you're doing that? So I know, it, I know it's not the same all the time. Kind of depends. It's not because the cadence, you know. Right. But right. when you're cow calling and you're just kind of herd talking, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. You know, a good two and a half, three minutes of a herd talk, you know, and then probably a, a a minute or two silence in between that and a little more herd talk, and, uh, and then you know, I mean, we'll we'll keep that going for forty five minutes, you know, thirty minutes. I mean, yeah. and then you just e elevate that sequence. And then, then that's what you got to remember too, is you need to wait another 30 minutes after you've done all of that. Cause a lot of these bulls were coming from a long ways off and they were coming in really silent. And uh, I mean, when we'd start moving off then we'd blow something up, you know, uh, heck we'd sat there a long time before that bull come in there looking for the party that I can end up killing, you know, but that was a long calling sequence. The first set we did cause RC had to take care of some business and uh, it was a, it was a pretty good time in between all that that me and Brendan sat up there in that park and just and and for me guys I I want I want uh, Mr. Visser to understand that man if I ain't heard a response I'm elevating everything so I, I'm just gonna get go ahead and get it worked up to where it sounds like a, a big bull's in there with a bunch of cows coming in to eat and I don't really let that scare me any because you know we either going to make it happen or we're going to move on to a different location and make it happen. Yeah, and and I I want to take I want to take Luis back to a thought and a comment that he made some podcasts ago that I thought you know we've all talked about this as well is that when we're doing scenarios when we're doing these calls even though we're not always getting responses and stuff <clears throat> sometimes it sure seems like it begins to light up the elk as well. Definitely. And, and it's like a day later or two days later, all of a sudden things that. are talking mm -hmm. that, that weren't talking. You know what I mean, Luis? Yeah. It's kind of like mm -hmm. breaking the ice, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's almost like us as callers, as, as we start talking and everything is silent, we kind of start breaking the ice and elk are listening elk and they, they want to talk and then just things kind of start getting lit up. And yeah, I remember making that comment. It was actually a question to you. If you, you know, I was like wondering if, if you thought that our influence as callers would have an impact on elk uh, starting to talk earlier. Well, it's all think, about yeah. which of course. Oh, most definitely. I think that because I think what happens is <clears throat> elk are tendency to be lazy anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're like, Oh wow. Party's going on over there. I'll check it out tomorrow yeah. or, or yeah, they later will. on tonight. I'll go over there and see what kind of party they had there. You when know? it's cold off or something yeah. like that. Yeah, see they want to join in. See, bring your own cow, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that that, that's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they want to join in. But, uh, you know, just one key thing that Gilbert said earlier that may have gone over some of our listeners' heads was the fact that he gradually builds his intensity you know, from inside out, which is, you know, you, you don't want to start real intense right off the bat, or you're going to scare some people, like, you know, scare the bulls or anything that's nearby, because all of a sudden a herd appeared from nowhere. Yeah. So you start the intensity low and, and build up. Yeah. And that that's even too, like when you said bugling too loud, we always call yeah. from near to far. So we always yeah. start with just a cow call <clears throat> with our mouth, kind of throwing it nice and quiet. Sometimes we'll still use our mouth, but we'll raise that tone a little bit. Then we'll do it through the grunt tube to send it out a little farther. We don't get anything. Then we'll go ahead and send a location bugle out. And look, there's even more intensities of that because sure. I've even then done a location bugle now with a <clears throat> chuckle on the end of it. Yep. Um, if I don't get anything, sometimes I'll send out a double bugle, my signature bugle out there because I find that I've seen so many times elk. In fact, who was, we were with somebody this year and I had said, I'm going to do a double bugle. This is the one thing almost always gets a response. And we didn't have one. And sure enough, if we didn't get a response to that double bugle. Yeah. And I, I really think it's because again, like you said, elk are listening for other elk's behaviors. Yeah. 
And yeah. there are certain sounds that signal certain things. When yeah. multiple bugles are happening in an area, especially multiple roundup bugles, um, you have challenge bugles. When it escalates to that, yeah. that, that encounter is telling other elk that mm. there's a hot cow in that area. Sure. And so that is then going to get, it's just like anybody, man. I mean, You're coming to the party. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can take two people that are completely calm and you can start having a conversation and you can say something in that conversation that the other person might take just a little bit offensively or mm -hmm. might get a little bit under their skin or might be attractive words to them. And it's going to change their emotions immediately. It's going to change how they communicate and you can see how voices start to escalate. You can take two completely calm people in a matter of seconds. You can escalate that. To that happened to me all the time with Luis. <laughs> <laughs> he say, he says sounds and we go into my, under my skin and boom. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in the elk world, you know exactly what we're talking about. But, yeah. but again, I, I really think because look, we are listening for other elk that are in a mode where they are wanting to communicate, where they're wanting to fight, where they're, where they're wanting to breed, and they are announcing where they're at. Other mm -hmm. elk hear that. They're listening for the same thing because they want the same thing. So mm -hmm. when they hear that, they're moving towards it. Why are we not able to be that party? And we are, and that's what we do sometimes. But exactly what Gilbert's saying is, you don't just, I mean, you don't start the party just with the friggin' banger music, man. You start. Yeah. <laughs> we ease into it. You got to ease into it, yeah. man. I, yep. And I, and I got to say this because I was so proud of our guys, man. Um, oh, man, dude, we got some of the best elk callers in the country. I mean, when you, when you listen to it uh, and you hear them, if even from afar, it sounds like a herd of elk around you. You know, when you hear Joe Gillia sounding off, when you hear the Flatlander Cole Wilkes, I mean, we had Joe and Cole and myself around and then Luis to the north of us. Dude, it sounded like a symphony of elk going on around us, dude. And, and the elk were responding because of what we were doing as well. I, and, we, and we weren't in, close to each other. We were several hundred yeah, yards away from each other. So. Yeah, quarter mile. You mm -hmm. know, yeah, and yeah. we, we were, yeah. to have RC and I called in several yeah. sets of hunters and they, they were like, man, did y'all hear that hurt? Elk? And we're like, we're the herd. <laughs> Big O, I, I was, I was call calling too. that yeah. count. Yeah, hey, for sure, bro. <laughs> for sure. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm so proud of our guys because Luis has come <laughs> such a, such a long way. And then Manano, Cal calling too, dude. I mean, for sure. Those, <laughs> I mean, Smith, you don't have to say that. <laughs> no, man. I heard you in camp, Cal calling. It sounded really good, bro. Manano, your Cal call sounded wonderful, bro. <laughs> yeah, dude. So, dude. And then look, I, I got the legend sitting there with me. He gets on that hyper call. Oh, my gosh, dude. It, I guarantee you make a bull made a black stump. You know, straight <laughs> up. You know that hyper call. I love that call. It's but, nasally, and I'd be, I'd be poking RC. Come on, man. Come on, get that thing round up. Because I know what it'll do. I've been with him, and, and uh, I heard that. They, I, you know, when I was trying, and I, and I like that because it, I, I think it made a difference this year, especially with my bull. Absolutely. Um, when, uh, when, when we were kind of calling that bull in, just having. The, 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 the ability of having the sound coming kind of from different locations. And he mm -hmm. came a long ways because, you know, one of the things that he was doing is, you know, when, when you're starting to cow call, <clears throat> you make a sound and it doesn't sound right. So you try to correct it and make another sound right away. And it doesn't sound right. You do it again. It doesn't sound right. So you end up making four sounds that sounds like an animal dying. Right. And so I was like, Manano, you know, I, I know exactly where you're going through. I went exactly through the same thing. If you don't get that second call. For like a year. Right? Yeah. Huh? For like a year. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I said, yeah. if you don't get that second call right, stop. And then give yourself a break. Yeah. And it's, but, you know, if you're in the house, great. But if you're in the woods, mm -hmm. if that second one comes out weird, the first one and the second one comes out weird, just stop. Give yourself a break. And then later on, try it again. But, and if you get that second one right, 
maybe try a third one, but then just kind of limit it at that. And, so and man, he started a, doing that and it worked out great. I think yeah. he was doing solid at the let end. Let me of give the, a cue uh, on that too, is a lot of people, when they start making bad calls, bad cow calls mm -hmm. um, with their diaphragm, it's, it's number one, the latex is either too stretched wow. yeah. or they're using the tip of their tongue instead of the flat part, middle mm -hmm. part of their tongue, the wide area. If you just take a second, shift that tongue, just slide that, you know, that, that wide area up to it, you'll get that. You'll get the. And, I, and I promise you in a 10 day hunt, you can wear a read out. Oh, well, and, yeah, and that happened to me this year because I, I wasn't used to that. I'd always used that one read for the yeah. whole hunt and right. never, and then Joe kind of educated me on that. And he's like, well, yeah. I mean, you're, you're now calling way more often. Oh yeah. And, and so now you're wearing them out. So yeah, towards like the middle of my hunt, I was like, I couldn't, I, it was funny. It was the first day that with it, but I couldn't make bull bull sounds. I couldn't bugle with it. RC, yeah. RC right. heard it. He goes, wow. Yeah. I wouldn't get that high pitch because yeah. I, didn't get yeah, I didn't wear it out. Yeah. Same thing happened to me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, you think about it, Luis, when, when I was doing all the calling, you would do, part yeah, of a sequence yeah. twice during a hunt right yeah, so yeah, mm -hmm, and maybe some little cow calls here so it's really not a lot of pressure not a lot of wear nothing like that where right. i'm keeping a diaphragm in my mouth working it the whole time now yeah. to answer your question though adam um can can we have um too much too much intensity and in calling yeah you got to work into it you just don't start out to it can there be too much calling and i'm going to be real careful about this because i guarantee you people say that we call too much i heard on a podcast today somebody talking about they heard somebody doing cow calls and did 35 cow calls in i don't know like three minutes or something like that i, I could very easily do that depending on Me the too. situation man yeah so um too much again depends it depends on what you Relative. believe in depends on your style depends on if you're just going the same call you know yeah 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 or <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know and and even that i mean i've done that where i've done a lost cow going into yeah. a bull, just ripping yeah. that like that yeah. and, and it distressed. Works. so yeah, it yeah. depends on the purpose behind it why you're yeah. doing something not just that you're doing it or for how much you're doing it. it's about why you're doing it, when you're doing it, what's the reasoning behind well, it? Well, Joe, a fine example of that is last year when right after Manano shot his bull for like the fifth time and 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 finally and I got it down. Uh you were you were trying to, you were you were trying to uh you know keep that bull's attention, remember? Oh, just kind of keep that bull's attention yes. and you got extremely like intense about it you were like yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. you started just ripping it and just kind of try to keep that bull's attention and keep him there Confusing. yeah absolutely and what happened man just the freaking whole mountain lit up then you had spikes behind you and, and just things coming in and just everything kind of started going crazy again I'll uh, go back to the out story. of something that we thought it was completely excessive and just kind of out of the absolutely. normal yeah absolutely but again when you're doing that think about it. it's almost like a rut fest sometimes you yeah. know and it, it's like berserk and these animals here and they're like hunters don't do that hunters don't exactly. do that i mean that's got to be elk going nuts <laughs> but i mean again i go back to the story that the time that i killed a bull and tried calling chav to me with double bugles obnoxiously yeah. i mean oh, one yeah. after here come the a, other here one come after the, bulls. the other and i called in four bulls before he got to me so yeah. you know one person's trash is another person's treasure so i and don't let people intimidate you about the way you call look if they don't like what you're calling and how you're calling well they can go to a different area if you're being successful then stick with what's working with you if you're not being successful then you got to make changes man that that's where i'm at with that so um bugling too Good loud question. again you know again we talked about proximity it's all about proximity so all that stuff's in there let's let's i and i hope that helps you out adam let's uh, go to the next one gilbert you bet this guy's name is carter medallion medallion is it, i hope so carter I, man dude look carter you can call me giggly if you want yeah. to but uh, he's hey, from it looks dakota. like he's from north dakota so yep. uh our brothers to the north up there uh mm -hmm. he says number one often you mentioned getting up high and calling for elk here in north dakota we're relatively flat yeah how much would you change your game plan on uh where you have 
elk in very good cover, but relatively fat, flat with some sand hills. Mm-hmm. I want to get out and try to call a, in a bull and have been practicing calling for about two years. Any other recommendations for that type of terrain? Set up. All about the setup, man. Definitely, man. You know, everything's about the setup when you're in lower country with bigger, bigger brush. Uh, and the thicker, the better. Uh, I just, you're going to get real close shots and uh, it'll all be about, hunting. yeah, for bow hunting. Yeah. Uh, and if, I mean, if he wants to call one in, um, you know, there's really no difference in me being above them or on their same plane other than the setup, like Joe said. Yeah, I, I think you're actually, look, if you're in North Dakota, you're relatively flat. You're already on the same plane as those critters. It's going to be hard for them if it's thick for them to see you calling. You're either using the terrain or you're using the brush. It's no different. Same game plan, man. You're just working through doing your calling. Do you that know? funnel. And I know some of that country because I've, I've, yeah. kind of, I've worked a bunch up there in the Teddy Roosevelt National Park and stuff like mm-hmm. that in the Badlands. And that ain't flat. <laughs> I got to tell you, uh-huh. uh, there's some there's some big daggum hills out there. And so, yeah, in some areas, but mostly, I mean, I get where he's coming from. It's yeah. mostly, mostly pretty flat. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, you're going to have that juniper there and uh, some canyons uh, and stuff. Some now, canyons now, and stuff. One of the differences that I found, like especially where, I, where we hunt up there on uh, some of our mesas, is that the elk are now going to not be bedding up in an upper third. They're going to drop off the edges of things and bed, mm-hmm. or they're going to get down in arroyos or drainages down in there where mm-hmm. it's a little bit cooler and they have some cover and uh they're you know they're not exposed so it it's all about it's the same thing elk have got to have the food they got to have the water they have to have thermal regulation they got to have security yeah so, yeah check for the trenages and stuff like that <laughs> you got a, a real good trenage but you got to have it right man. <laughs> fellas even in, when we talk about you guys set up your wind direction is so important in that setup right absolutely and, and where they're going to transverse to come into your setup are they going are you going to have something in front of you or are you going to set up on the south side of a park with a north facing north blowing wind in your face and you're set up on on the outside of on the south side of the park when that bull's got to come out of that park that little bitty it could be <clears throat> even as something as 75 yards He's going to come to the edge from the north side where you're hearing him, and he's going to hit that park, and he's going to expect to see elk. If you set up on the south side of that park, that's a bad setup. Set up on the north side of the park where he's got to come to the north edge, and he's going to still be in the brush. You'll have a, a really good shot of him coming in that in that direction. He may come a little east or west of you, but if you set up across that park, he's going to it, it happened to RC and I this year. We knew we had a little a little thing in front of us, and we knew that that could hang that bull up. And if we would have set up on the north side of that, on the cross the the Trinos that was there, a little creek that was there, if we'd have set up on that other side, that those bulls wouldn't have hung up. They would have hung up right in our face. You know what I mean? Uh, instead of us trying to pull them across. So well, and those I are think- the things about set up. That's, that's where a lot of people in that realization, like a lot of people, they hear elk bugling and they're moving and they come up to a clearing and, yeah. and it's, it's almost a natural response to set up immediately without going into that clearing mm-hmm. to set up and try to call them so that you can see them on the other side. And you just set yourself up for failure. You get to see the elk, like, like yeah. you were saying, you get, you get to, to see them, but you don't get to kill them because <laughs> no. that, that elk is and, and, and maybe, maybe something that would help in that situation is if you have a decoy, you know, when you set the decoy up, maybe that'll help pull him across, but 90% of them, when they come to that edge of that park and they don't see a live elk, they know something's up, especially oh. them older bulls that have been called before. Now, the other option is if you do have a partner, and the shooter's on the edge, and the partner's back in 400, 600 away. yards yeah, that's to pull them across. Then, for sure. yeah, then that can that's happen, right. and you can get a good shot. Mm-hmm. We, we do things like that. Let's go to the second one. Grinders tuning in, thank you for listening to the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Podcast. Our goal is to share our knowledge and help you flatten that learning curve so that you too can have some of the 
very same incredible experiences that have given all of us here at Elk Bros a lifetime of memories. If you like what you hear or see, you can get all of this information plus so much more from our Base Camp Elk Hunting Training Camp, the first in a series of online courses from our Blue Collar Elk Academy. Our Base Camp Training Camp allows me to use my coaching style and share almost 40 years of elk hunting experiences successfully hunting elk on public lands as well as over 20 years guiding hunters of all ages and experience levels. This course will be like nothing you have ever experienced in concept and structure using success-based coaching techniques that will elevate your confidence and skill sets. Our camp will prepare you specifically from that final moment most in your control, those final minutes or seconds the elk is in front of you, backwards through each step and level, allowing you to see, visualize, understand, and relate every coaching point to what lies ahead, the next step, the next thought process, the next success. Because y'all, you've already been there. You know what it looks like. By tapping my 30 years of teaching and coaching experience, our camps are developed considering multiple learning modes with text, visuals, audio, as well as video. And Base Camp will benefit those new to elk hunting all the way to the 10 to 15 year vet. So if you are looking for that one thing to help you fill that tag this year, invest in the most important piece of equipment there is, you and your elk hunting knowledge. You can find the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Academy and the Base Camp Training Camp at elkbros.com. That's E-L-K-B-R-O-S dot com. Keep dreaming of the screaming, believing in achieving, and most of all, keep grinding. With limited elk numbers, where I, I will try calling, and if I don't get a response the first time out, if I go back another time and call, how should I change things up the second time? Uh, I realize a lot of calling is timing, but if a bull or bulls have heard me, are there changes you can make to sound different and uh, use a different set of diaphragm calls, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right, Joe? Yeah, you can. The, the thing that you have to be careful of is as callers, we develop a rhythm. Yep. And it, it sometimes it doesn't matter what diaphragm call we put in our mouth. We almost do the same rhythm. It's almost like the same intro before we go up to our high note, almost the same way going down. I guarantee I can tell Cole Wilkes just about anywhere, man, because wow. a lot of times he's going to finish that bugle and he's going to throw out that little, you know, uh, grunt scream that he does at the end of it. And, and I, it, it just becomes a natural same rhythm. Intro. So yeah. sometimes you have to change that up as well. You can change diaphragm calls or you know, you can grab an external call, you know, like yeah. if you're doing cow calls and you want something different, Ooh, I don't use externals, but right. I, I, I guarantee you, I can go from a Phelps call to a, a, a Wapiti River Outdoors call, and Sound I can different. get a different sound on those boogers, man. I just got to change my rhythm and my cadence just a little bit, just to sound yeah. like something different. I was going to say earlier that I think when you, when you are calling that you need to say, okay, Right now, I'm going to do a sequence of a herd, okay? And that's, that's something that you could think about doing today. You could go in there and say, you know, I'm going to make it sound like there's a herd and a bull, and you're going to take them away, right? Yeah. Well, tomorrow, you may want to do a locate. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I, or a lost I mean, cow. It makes sense, I RC. It's basically, it's basically telling yourself what what are you going to do and and, and i'm going to i'm going to take a, a reference to to pilots you know when you're piloting a plane you want the plane to go where you want to versus just flying out there and just kind of just, going everywhere right? just, yeah. just going everywhere it's basically have an intent before you actually do it and make sure that when you follow through you actually do what you intended to do and that you way know, you practice to and, and like yeah. you have a plan. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, some, I will tell. Go ahead, Joe. Sometimes my plan becomes dynamic just because sometimes a call comes out of me a little different. And then all of a sudden I, so like, for example, I've done this before. Um, I've gone and I've laid three different reeds out on my leg and mm -hmm. I will sound like a large bull, a small bull, 
and and a, and a, a, a medium sized bull and I'll make them sound like just communicating from different areas sure. and then I'll start to bring them together I'll, I'll have the medium and the mature bull start to get a little more aggressive and then mm -hmm. that small bull just kind of squealing on the side so I play it accordingly to what I have heard and how mm -hmm. I have seen elk but like if I did something that the other one if I did it and all of a sudden it sounded a little more aggressive, dude, I start to get into the play of it so much that I, yeah. I mean, I, I play the <laughs> parts, play. man. Yeah, and it's like writing a book. Play. Yeah. It's like yeah. writing a book. Well, you're telling that story. And, yeah, and Carter, absolutely. one of the things I want you to know too, is if you get a bull talking to you, your best chance of killing that bull is the first time you talk to him. The first time you get to bugle at him, because those bugles that you're going to do, he's going to get to know that bugle. And if you can get in there on him, you'll have the best opportunity to kill him the first time. Because Absolutely. If you... I, yeah, I hear what you're saying there. And, and, and that's where, you know, that's where we're saying is sometimes if you can change up yeah. what read you're using and your cadence and bring something different. And, and what I tell people is it doesn't even have to be a full bugle, man. You get out there and you just get that. <laughs> you just kind of growl a little bit as you're going out there, or just become a chuckler. Happy, look, I, every hunter out there has found a bull during the elk season and they, they call him the chuckler. Cause that's exactly. all he does. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe the you monkey become bull. a chuckler. So, yeah. So you mm -hmm. can change things up and you can use different diaphragm calls. You can use externals, but you got to think about what calls you're using. And, and what I mean by that is the style of the type of call and the rhythm to the call and the cadence to the call, as well as the reads you get in there. So, and Joe, you know, you mentioned the chuckle, the chuckle is an invite. So if you get bulls chuckling at you, they're inviting you to come. You yeah, know, I, I you know, I, I think when I hear when I hear just a chuckle to me, it's very mm -hmm. passive to me when I hear mm -hmm. just a chuckle. But mm -hmm. when I get a bull that's bugling and grunt chuckling on the end of it, it's mm -hmm. almost like he's, you know, it's almost mm -hmm. like he's getting worked up to me. You yeah. know, it's just kind of like, yeah, I'm just getting worked up on there. And wow. and I'm not a biologist, it's just what I feel and what I've seen from animals out there. That's so, right. you know, that's when right. I start to hear that, and that's why I, some like I had to tell Cole, you know, Cole. Just, just give that bugle, man, and then nothing on the end. Because right, no chuckle. You're, you're, yeah, don't give that bull too much information right now right, because, right. you know, I, I don't want him to know anything else about you, about your disposition until he starts yeah. coming in or until he raises his emotion up. You know, That's so, right. and, and then sometimes when you do that, I mean, it has the great effect. I mean, you go out and you scream and you give that after it and you give that the rest of it and it, and it gets that other dude worked up. It's just, you got to take that temperature and yeah. sometimes I can do it without, you know, giving everything to them. Right. You know, it's kind of yeah. like, it's kind of like this, man, when you're the pitcher, you don't give them the heat right away. Exactly. You, you don't know? throw every pitch you got in the first inning. Yeah, man. It just, yeah. uh, just like that. All right. Number three. In learning how to call, I bought a number of diaphragm calls. I sorted them by easiest to make believable elk sounds to the harder to make elk sounds with a few in between. I practice with the tougher to use diaphragm calls and go back to the easier ones. And I feel like when I step back to the diaphragm calls that were the easiest to call with at, at the start, I feel like I have even more control over the call. Over time, my sound is getting better and with more difficult with and better with the more difficult diaphragm calls as well. I would guess the biggest difference is softer latex versus stiffer, heavier latex. And and I am I on something or on to something <laughs> practicing? It's the nail on the head, right man. On the head. 100%. And and to kudos, your own man. question, brother. Kudos, yeah. kudos to Mr. Carter here because man, he's really putting in the time and effort to I can I can to, tell you this, Mr. Falling. Carter. I can tell you this. When I got a call that don't sound good, yeah, it goes in the trash. <laughs> I ain't messing no, with man. it. I, no, man. No, because a, what he's I'm talking about, up. bro, what he's talking about is there's some calls that the latex is so stiff, to, it, it, yeah. it's so hard to do a cow call. Yeah, but you can yeah. scream bugles on it forever. And yeah, then yeah. after you scream on it for about a half day, now you can do cow calls on it because you've softened that. True. Break I, I see what you're saying, Joe. Yeah. But if, for me, when I'm coming to elk camp, I got my hit list already re ready to roll, right? So I'm not trying to break calls in. Uh, so, but I, I get where Joe's at. For me, it's, you know, when those calls 
they're in the hit list. They're in the pocket. I mean, I'm, I'm pulling the first one out. It's a hammer. I mean, yeah. it's going to make great sounds and everything else. If I got to keep working with it, I probably need to do that at camp and not have to try to break it in out in the field. So you want to yeah. have two or three of those ready to rock and roll when you get ready to get out there and do your sequence. Yeah. And I think, I think what he's saying here, it's also important. I think what he's realized in this, the, the, the reads that are harder for him to kind of make believable sounds. Once he has a good handle of those and he goes back to the easy ones, he does way better. And it's almost like he's learned like the more control you have over harder reads, the more control you get when you try to go with the easier ones because now you've kind of tuned better the way you you actually manipulate the read, I guess. Yeah, because it's tongue pressure, man. So yes. if I'm if I'm able to use tongue pressure to get a sound off of a more stiff latex, when I go to an easy latex, man, I I can I can play that thing like a flute because it's like practicing at 80 yards and then trying to shoot at 20. That's, that <laughs> yeah, is a buddy. great analogy right there, man. Yeah. It's just it's it's like anything, you know, uh, you know you you're working that that muscle, man. You're using that muscle memory against that latex. So once I do the tougher one and I go to the easier one, you know, or the lighter, softer mm -hmm. latex, mm -hmm. it's so much easier to use that softer easier latex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and actually for me, um, I really don't like too stiff of a latex. I like a medium latex that I can do bugles with it and get some cow calls. It yes. might be a little loud at first because they're going to soften up as I go. But mm -hmm. if I need to do bull calls, if I need to do bull uh, bugling, you know, or screaming bugles, or especially if, man, if you do get to that point in a rut where you got a lot of challenge stuff going on, you know, mm -hmm. then it gets a little ridiculous, man. I mean, you're just cranking on that puppy because when I'm doing location bugles, that doesn't take a whole lot of pressure, man. It's like when you're going to scream at something that, you know, you're getting, that, ah! you're getting that dog on. Well, man, and it can go on for a long time, Joe. It I mean, can. I, the bull I called in for Chav one time, it was a long sequence. I, I bet it was 30 minutes of me, you know, working on that bull and he, you know, bugling and I'd cut him off and stomp on him. And I mean, it was back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I wasn't even that good back then. You know what I mean? But I mean, we just keep getting him all worked up and it was back and forth, back and forth. And I thought, it was, you know, he was real close and it took him, I bet it took him 25 minutes to get to us. But every time he'd, you know, haul off and really let out a big, you know, uh, lip ball bugle i just stomped back on him you know and that got him even more incensed you know and, and uh he kept coming and i think a lot of people need to realize too when they think like because a bull is always closer than you think when you're hearing yeah. a lot of times yeah. you know yeah. unless it's early early morning and it's bouncing through the mountains they're always closer than you think and a lot of times you're like man they're not coming man they're not coming well, they come in their time and you don't know what's around them. You don't know if, <laughs> yeah. if they have a trenosh they have to get through. Exactly. <laughs> the trenosh they got across. You don't know if they have a cow with them. And, yeah. you know, I've got video of a bull that comes to an area and he stops and he is worked up, man. He's got like, if you've seen one of the work, they're oh. like dripping spit and yeah. everything. And all oh. he's doing, he's looking around, he's working the ears he hears a bugle to this side and then all of a sudden he hears me over this side and he's like, well, which way do I go? He takes yeah. a couple of steps and then he just stands and listens. I mean, it's their time, man. So a lot of times it's not like we always envision that they're like, they're coming to us all the time. And that's, that's not the case. They look they, at that bull I killed a few years ago, Joe, when we had to stand off with him. Not only did we call him across a barrier and he was in a wallow for 20 minutes and then came across the barrier, he walked up that mountain to us and stood there for the longest time surveying the situation. Right? For eight minutes, and man. He, and he was oh, worked up. That's man. a freaking eternity, man. Oh, just, dude, you got God. no clue. You got to have the patience of Job and the nerves of steel to stand in there with that booger looking at you. Because you know at any minute, a gust from the gods could end the whole deal. Yeah. You know? Um, so yeah. yeah, I mean, they, they come in their own time and, 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 and watch certain there things on their ever. body behavior. Like if you see them, like when, when we talk about a bull palpitating, that's when they're, they're bouncing themselves when they're urinating on the mm -hmm. bottom. And a lot of times you'll see that bull, he'll just start bouncing like that. When you see that he's working himself up. 
you know, yeah. when you see that belly bouncing up and down and he's doing any kind of urinating, a lot of times he's bugling and screaming when he does that. But if you can see him and he just starts to do it, he is, that bull's getting worked up. He's in great position. He's ready to be called in like that. Now, if you see that bull man that, that he kind of stands and those ears are both going just like this <laughs> and he kind of stands straight up with that real high head and he starts putting that nose up, there's a little oh, bit of nervousness going on there. For sure. Now, they will smell and you'll see stuff dripping out of their mouth and stuff like yeah. that. But when they start doing this double tip up into the air, oh. something you, I'm hoping that you're shooting here real soon because <laughs> they, <laughs> it's going to be over. It's getting ready to be gone. <laughs> well, and just remember when it does get over and they break and go, you can stop them, you know, oh, yeah. and, and with the cow call, you can stop them or even a, a bark, uh, a bark or something like that. Bark chuckle. You from, can, and, and yeah. try it, man, because if he smells you, he might not stop, but if right. it's just nervousness, he just might, I've had bulls turn and walk away and get, yeah. And they turn and come they come right. back, man, just yeah. like that. And yeah. elk, look, when elk leave out, like if they're standing, how, how they came in is how they're going to go out. And if you call them, it's generally exactly how they're going to come back. That I mean, they go to the path that they've already checked as being mm -hmm. safe. So, that's right. yeah, that's pretty cool. Luis, oh, no, Chab, you're up next with, with Matt. Okay, Matt Deal from Greensburg, Pennsylvania. He asks... How did you guys choose a unit you went to? I honestly don't want to know which unit it was because I don't want to steal anyone's spot. Just wondering how you go about choosing a unit. Well, I can tell you that uh, it started with some e-scouting, you know, scouting for the basic stuff like water, food source, shelter, you know, the natural escape routes and all that stuff. Uh, but we also got boots on the ground, you know, uh, Joe, RC and, uh, Cole got out there and actually walked some of that area. But one of the things that uh, that kind of determined where we went was uh, accessibility. The, we went to one spot first, but you know, if you can get a Greyhound bus up there, <laughs> the, accessibi <laughs> the accessibility was the accessibility too was it was too good. Was too yeah, much. we had a Greyhound uh, parked across from our camp, man. Yeah, our original camp. Oh, so yeah. the second place yeah the second place we ended up uh joe actually had some encounters uh with elk so we knew the elk were there and it was also the accessibility was a little bit tougher getting there though there were a lot of people there it wasn't quite as crowded as as our first spot but that's just the generalities i don't know if you want to be more specific joe on, on how yeah. we pick those yeah. so um i cheat i i steal other people's honey hole no i mean it's just like uh yeah, actually you know, for us, it really what it came down to was we were going to another state. Now I guide and I've hunted in northern New Mexico up close to the Colorado border. So to me, it really made a lot of sense to be on the other side of that border in country that was a lot like what I have already hunted that I understood. Um, and it was very similar. I mean, like I, I told everybody, shoot, I've already been hunting on the other side of the fence. This is just, I know there's elk here. So I kind of went to units that, um, number one, were close enough for us to go scout. Um, and we did go even a little further than that in to see yeah. things, but I never went past central Colorado. I, I never considered anything up near the Denver area because I had to consider Manano, Luis and Gilbert, those guys coming in from Texas that would have added another eight hours to their trip on there. So, you know, when you think about that, then it starts adding other problems to the hunt because people are using a lot of time just to get there. And then towards the end, they're thinking about having to get all the way home. So they kind of lose a little bit of their focus on the hunt, thinking just about things like that. And so I consider that stuff when I'm doing it. So I knew it took us from Cimarron to, to get into our hunting area at least four, four and a half hours sometimes to get in. So that was kind of our travel distance from where we were going. So I kind of tried to keep it within that. Now in Colorado, there's a ton of elk in Colorado. I, you know, I believe you could throw a doggone uh, dart on the board and go hunt someplace. But I just limited myself to a certain level of going in there. And once we did that, then you got to consider, you got to consider things like food. And, and I really like to look at areas in 3D 
because I've looked at enough places that hold elk that I can look at a 3D map and get a feel for places that look elky, where they have built-in funnels coming or where they have saddles coming across, where they have openings down in the bottom of a creek area that's not too steep, that has a little grass down there, or has places off the north where there's a bunch of benches where they could go down and feed, that they have water nearby. So I'm looking for things that I know are going to be attractive, that they have some of those north faces that are going to work for them. How much beetle kill? Is there a fire? Is there fringes on the beetle kill? Is there fringes on the fire? So all of this stuff kind of gets me in the ballpark. And actually, we kind of looked at, and I, and honestly, I, I start calling all the resources I can and talk to people about where are they finding elk in some of the areas and in, in there and, or not so much where they finding elk, but, you know, look at the summer migrations. Colorado is incredible with the data. You can take a look and it'll show you elk calving areas, um, what they call production areas. It'll show you their migration routes. If you find a production area with a migration route, summer and winter going by it, dude, look, you want to go where cow elk are going to be. That's called a production area. So yeah. Those types of things help cue me in to where I want to go. And then from there, once I start marking it, then again, it's boots on the ground because I can drive on a highway and look and go, hmm, people don't look like they go over there because that looks hard to get to and it looks like good area. And then I start checking it out and different things. So I, and look, I don't mind getting a mile off a highway at all, especially a lot of people drive by it. So these are just some of the things. And then you know, you go, you check it out. If it pans out, you know, um, the unit we were in was a huge unit with all well, kinds of things. Okay. I think uh, one of the biggest things is you got to get boots on the ground. Yeah. I absolutely. mean, because the thing about it, you think about we're our number one choice. You went and looked at it and you go, oh my gosh, nope. this is yeah. zero. Yeah. And, you know, so that's why I say you, you definitely got to do. And my original boots on the ground too was, was not really so much to find elk. It was to see the lay of the land. Yeah. How we were going to be able to set up camp. And, and then, you know, Joe does a fantastic job of understanding the levels of, of our team too. You know, uh, we had a scenario where we needed to, to be able to put chav somewhere and, and Joe knows, man, you know, this, that's some of the biggest country we've hunted, no doubt, but uh, Joe knows, me, man, I, if I can find me a road system, I need to be able to get to the top and start going. Cause I'm telling you, starting from the bottom and going up there, woohoo, man, that's some big daggum country. You got to be in shape and round is a shape. And, uh, at the end of the day, he knew that there were going to be some of our guys that were limited, mainly me. I mean, everybody else is rock solid as far as I have asthma. I mean, you know, there's a lot of underlying uh, unsure fasciitis. There's yeah, man, all kinds of different <laughs> things. But for me, it's about understanding that. For me, I got to get started a little earlier and getting up there to those higher country areas. But I, I learned tremendous amount of what necessarily i need to do is understand the road system when i get there right yeah. well and, anybody does gilbert really right. i think that is key man i if you know where the roads are you know where pressure is coming from or yes. you know where you can get into different ways or you know how to get an animal out of an area yeah. road system i Huge. mean so, so that's like me you know i hiked all the way in two hours and uh and and went across several chernoshes and uh, right. <laughs> to, and right. up a lot to get up into an area that I thought there was nobody and end up, you know, bugling in you on one side and bugling in coal on another yes. because there when was a road up the, there, you know, you could have so. drove a road. Yeah, you <laughs> walked up the road yourself. Yeah. yeah. But uh, you know, so yeah, that that's real critical. And I, I think, I think that the unit you pick, you just, uh, there are elk in Colorado and you just have to, take a look to find those little holes that other people are going by. And, and I'll tell you this, honestly, man, we found elk within less than a mile from where everybody was camping several Hell camps. Yeah. And, Hell yes. you know, and it's mm -hmm. because everybody drives by them, man. And the elk get used to that. So 
uh, I mean, that's, that's not your question there. It's like, how do we pick? And, and I gave you an idea, you know, I'm looking for certain travel distance. I'm looking for certain features and then I'm looking for certain lay of the land and I'm looking for things that are going to fit our group. And, yeah, and that's and something they'll have everybody has to reports think about too. They'll What's have that? harvest reports you can look at. Absolutely. Too, so you can go to their DNR or whatever and check out their, their recent harvest reports. And so you'll know, you know, what success has been in the area yeah. versus how many tags they've been bought. I mean, it, look, it's, it's overwhelming when you look out West, if you're going to be one of those 10 percent. Well, all I know is, man, we, you know, we went to one unit before this unit. They said, you got to bring your own rock to sit on in that unit. And, yeah. and, and really I, that doesn't bother me a bit. And, no? you know, uh, and success rates, eh, they only bother me they don't bother me either man i right. i just know we can go get done what we need to get done if there's elk there and if there's and elk there, that's the that's goal right. of it so yeah and and you guys were worried i mean i kept hearing that it's like well if are there elk there but you well, know it's colorado they're gonna, it's colorado. gonna have it you know there's elk man yeah. and uh if if there's ag if there's river area you know it, there's gonna be elk there so yep um Luis. Luis, blake johnson yeah. Sir Blake Johnson, born and raised in Alabama. The good uh, He says, Alabama. I've listened to 50 of your ep- uh, podcasts over the past two weeks in preparation for my elk, for my first elk hunt. So that's, that's, that's a, a ton of download right there. Definitely. Uh, in two weeks, that's, that's impressive. <laughs> I'll be hunting. He says, I'll be hunting Colorado for the first rif- rifle season, October 16th through the 20th. And he's saying, being fairly new to the area, I'm still learning the terrain and weather. <clears throat> My first question is, what do you recommend for hunting clothes? Uh, I know we can't predict the weather, and I have looked at historical averages, but I'd like to get my camel ahead of time, and I'm not sure how warm I need my gear to be. And then he also has a couple, uh, two follow qu- uh, follow-up questions, but I guess we can tackle that yeah. first one first. Well, what do you, so, layers. you know, layers, 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 absolutely. And you know what? I, I don't find much difference in October there and in, in my layers than I, other than I might add a, add a thin layer of Merino to my, under my britches, mm-hmm. or, um, or, or yeah. I might need another layer of just a different jacket up on jacket. top, mm-hmm. you know, cause Starting I'm all, early in the morning. Yeah. Because, I mean, we already get out in weather that's in 30s, and you're going to be out sometimes. I mean, it depends on the level that you're at when you're, yeah. when you're there. I mean, uh-huh. you, but I really don't feel much difference between 18-degree weather and, and 30. 30, yeah, or 30-degree yeah. weather, mm-hmm. you know, if you're moving. You yeah. Know, uh, yeah. Make sure you have a, um, a neck gaiter. Mm-hmm. Um, make sure that you have a stocking cap as well as a bill cap because you know yeah. in that early morning especially if you sit that stocking cap is real nice but if you're really going hard it's nice to put on that other cap so that you know you let some of that heat off your head and you're not sweating too much mm-hmm. uh, if you're going to stop in glass you need some extra clothes to go over top of things mm-hmm. uh, but you don't want to sweat sweat is your enemy if you're Big going to time. stop in glass man because you'll sit there and freaking shiver if you mm-hmm. do that so um, you know, I, I wear regular hunting britches. If it gets real cold, I put uh, a layer underneath of it. Yeah, merino. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Either merino or some kind of, uh, thicker type of, uh, yeah, um, britches you're... underneath of yeah, it. Yeah. Um, and then on my top, I'm already doing a merino with like a shirt. And then I, I layer to a light jacket, maybe, um, uh, a, a thin, warmer jacket i like a vest as well and then i'll probably have something just a little bit thicker for on those cold cold days you know like that and i can strap that on the outside of my pack i can break things off and and look as soon as you start sweating stop take crap off and yeah don't don't you know because that's one thing i don't like about bino harnesses i think a lot of people don't stop and strip down because they don't want to take off the bino harness and they're not you know, so, you know, if you're starting to sweat, stop, take stuff off, you know. Yes. Because no, that's 100 percent, Joe. I mean, look, I'm a hot blooded fella anyway, and I don't wear a whole lot of uh, undergarments because I'm telling you, I'm going to heat up the first 
quarter mile uh, starting out. So, you know, it don't matter how cold it is. I mean, we hunted last year in the coldest I've ever seen with, you know, four or five inches of snow on us. And I really wasn't prepared to have all that. But, you know, Joe lent me one little top and that was it, man. I, you know, it was a, a really nice, uh, warm, uh, kind of like a Merino top with a little hoodie in it. And uh, it was fantastic. I put that under a, a vest and then I put my rain gear, uh, which is a, a real nice Cabela's MT50 type uh, rain gear. I put that jacket on and man, I'm telling you, I was snug as a bug in a rug. But for me, it's the base layer for me is that's moisture wicking yeah. that I want to wear. You know? If you can, and I, I used to laugh at Merino um, because yeah. again, I'm a Walmart, Chav and I are Walmart yeah. camo dudes. Yeah. Um, always have been because we couldn't afford. And, and I found some of that, uh, um, first it was light. first light Merino that I found yeah. on uh, uh, Black Ovis on sale. Mm -hmm. And, and I just look for it when it's on sale and I'll buy one because you can wear a doggone Merino uh, layer, thin layer for days and it doesn't smell, you know, they're, they're really good about that. Chav, uh, you know, you're a little, you get a little bit colder than I do. What do your layers look like? Well, well I, I do have uh, an under layer for the pants because, uh, you know, especially this year sitting in the blind, but <laughs> I, I did freeze to death one, <laughs> one, one day. Uh -huh. You know, I wasn't quite prepared for uh, as cold as it got. But then again, you know, I'm, I wasn't active. Usually, right. usually when I when I was walking and stuff, uh, totally different. Yes, yeah, totally, totally different. But if, if you're inactive or if you're sitting by a, a, a or if you have a ground line, if you're sitting by a, a, a pond or a a waller, you know, it's a, a lot different. You better prepare for the cold. And being from Alabama, it. I'm not sure if you're <laughs> now he's in Colorado now. Oh, he's in Colorado now. Yeah. And I yeah. I got a chance to talk. He's to born him. and raised in Alabama. It gets cold as as, as it anything in Alabama. I mean, it's cold. Alabama. Yes, yeah. snows there. Yeah. And and Blake, I got a chance to talk to him. He's a great young man. And uh, um, yeah, so he's in Colorado now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just layers, brother. I mean, yeah. you just work on your layers and. Uh, you're going to be fine. I, I would dress for 20 degrees early in the morning and 60 degrees in the afternoon. You know? Yeah. I mean, if he's, if he's in Colorado already, then he experienced some snowfall mm -hmm. already in the area. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. he'll be, yeah. I think he'll do fine. So let's yeah. take this next part of that, Luis. Next part is also a couple other questions. He says, should I use archery partner calling techniques during the first rifle? Uh, no. I mean, uh, I, you're using a rifle dude. So, you know, where we're trying to pull an animal to somebody using, you know, partner calling techniques or one person's back behind them and trying to pull an animal from being hung up, shoot. I don't care if that bull hangs up at 80 yards now. Hey, you know? right, shooting him yeah. in his face. Yeah. And, and, and really at, on that date, on the 16th, you're pretty much just doing location calling anyway and, and chasing bugles. Sneaking and you, in there on him. It's all about, I mean, if, before you can kill an elk, you got to find an elk. Locate and all you're trying to yeah. do is locate him, you and know. get in there on him. Yeah. Get him sounding off. Get into yeah. a position where you can get a shot, paying into attention the to the wind, where you can yeah. him and take care of business. So Heck yeah, man. I mean, I, I'm telling you, I've been elk hunting now 12 years. The last five years, if I had a rifle, I've been tagged out on day one just about every day because you can just get him into that location. I mean, we. For me, and I've said this a thousand times, if I see an elk, he's in serious trouble. My woodsmanship is good enough where I can get in there and close the gap within 80 to 100 yards. The Mohican uh, sneak on him. Yeah, we put the Mohican sneaking on them, brother, and they're in serious <laughs> trouble. Uh, if I had a rifle, and, and look, I'm not above <laughs> shooting one with a rifle, so good on you, Mr. Johnson. I hope you go down there and slay a big one, man. Yes, sir. And, and RC, that's kind of y'all's specialty when you were there. It was the rifle season in October. Uber. What, what was y'all's yeah. technique with that did y'all use calls did you just let them do the call and did you stay silent i a little both yeah you know mm -hmm. you, it's um uh, if you can figure out where they're at mm -hmm. i mean you just make a play for it and and again you're in a different situation you're not trying to get them in the trees you you know you're looking to, well i know that there's a big park 
like uh, where uh, Gilbert shot his bull, mm -hmm. and it, if you knew that they were headed that direction, you beat them to it. Beat them to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's going to be wide open and. Yeah, it's just, that's kind of what we did. It's a, yeah, and, and I'll just tell you, if you if they are sounding off on their own, it's always best to not give yourself or your position yeah. away, man. Right. You know, now, if you have no idea that there's elk someplace and you're trying to locate from the top of a ridge, yep. well, great. But then, you know, move in, let them, if they're talking, let them talk. Yeah, um you know uh it, it's always better not to give yourself away because it's easier to get in position on an animal if they're not looking or you know if they think another bull let's say that there is a late they're around them cows from bull then they're going to start pushing their cows up into the trees and yeah. you want them in the open so that, that's just something for you to think about mm -hmm. and, and lastly he's saying do i need to debone my meat and get it in the cooler as soon as possible in Depending october 16th to 20th um, you know how hot it is yeah but most likely uh, at that time, man, you're going to be able to quarter it, hang it, and it's going to cool down. You know, uh, if it does get hot, you know, then then you got to think about that. But, you know, uh, right now here, every morning has been around 44 degrees here right now. And we're at 6,500. So yeah, it's supposed to drop down in the 20s next yeah. week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in, in the mornings. Or yeah at night and once that meat that internal temperature that meat is going to be cooler than that external anyway mm -hmm. so once you get that you know quartered out and you get that Open stripped off up. and you get it hang it cooled down it's going to do pretty good for you so you know that that should be fine i can tell you this I ate a piece of my oak last night and it was fantastic. So I, and it was hot. It was hot when we had to, you know, do everything, but we got him down there quick, got him butchered and got him on ice quick. So, I mean, if it's hot, yes, you need to get him in a cooler ASAP, but if it's, if it's moderate, you know, between 35 and 55 degrees, shoot, you got time. You got plenty of time, man. Yeah. So Manano, take the next one there, bud. Okay, this is a question from Mr. Kyle Green from Louisiana. For my first time out elk hunting this year, I hired a guy for archery hunt, but he really never called. We just chased bugles in the morning and evening. I never said anything to him or asked him why he didn't call because I didn't want to try to guide my guide. But when is it appropriate to suggest other strategies to my guy? Oh. So challenge him. I cha I challenged Joe one time. He was <laughs> I was going behind him, and I said, "Joe, please don't do it again." I don't want to explain. <laughs> what What are you talking about? Wait, well, nobody understands what he's well, talking about. Well, I know that. I know. I don't want to explain yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. He said, but, "I think I think he's referring to you farting, and he challenged you dude, not to fart." Okay, right? so I, yeah. I, I want I want you to. We're, we're going to settle this once for all because I've, I've used to this, but I have had Manano behind me with wind in my face. And his are so bad they go upwind, dude. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> somebody pissed it off, Joe. It's going upwind. <laughs> and Manano's back there going like this from his own. He's like, <coughs> and he's spitting. You know, I'm like, what happened? Oh, oh, it's yeah. bad. It's bad. Yeah. <laughs> you know that, it. That was horrible, Joe. That was freaking horrible. <laughs> okay so let's get back to this when is it appropriate to that's a touchy subject that? joe huh? it's, that's it a is. touchy subject it really is. it's not i, I, I think, think it's you not gotta a... manage expectations before you ever go hunting brother yeah mm. but i think it's not a challenge i mean i i think it's a matter of questioning him like like okay let me learn what's the strategy mm -hmm. what's going to be the plan that or, should have been or... handled before the hunt started yeah, well, sometimes we, we got there uh, this season and we thought, okay, we're going to call every single step we made. So, no, we we, right. we changed strategy as soon as we hit the, the woods. So, the strategy yeah. can change. But if you feel uncomfortable, just ask like a, in, in a kind way, just, hey, what's going to be the plan or do you think we're going to, uh, you okay. know, have success with this strategy? I, th you I think if... 
Go ahead. I think John. if I think if you're going to hire a guide, you you would want to know if he can call before you even yes. hire hire him. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, just, just my thought. You know. Managing expectation that Gilbert's talking. Right. about. I mean, you should be one hundred percent need yeah. to be talked about before I ever wrote the wrote the check to him. You know. Yeah. What uh, What's their style? Does it match your mm -hmm. style? Again, that's a we've talked about matching your profile. You mm -hmm. know, with the type of hunt that you're going to be on, what type of hunter you are, what you're looking for, what you're desiring out of a hunt, uh, because that can get missed real quick. And we're well, looking. We call more than most. I would say most probably 90% of everybody out there. We just do. That's kind of what because, we do. I mean, but you were trained by me and that's my, I'm right. Real, you know, right. Whereas, well, we're going to blow up enough stuff to get into more stuff. You know what I mean? And, uh, but I've hunted with others that don't call RC, them. RC Knox, Carl Gamet. Yeah. Uh, they hear a bugle. We're getting in there with them. Right. Yeah. And, and, then, and look, we, we got to understand Sir Green's first time out elk hunting yeah. ever. Mm -hmm. so you know he doesn't know any better right so mm -hmm. yeah i think he's just no, uh don't know what you don't uncertain know. how to approach the question about calling or not calling and and to me it's like just you know just say that it's like hey man i don't know any better but i've heard people you know call calls elks in and stuff like that is that is that is your strategy different and why and i just i'm just here to learn as well anything that you can share with me as far as your approach and how you hunt I think it would be the best way to to tackle that 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 question, you know. So yeah. I I'm going to give you two different views that I have because I'm a professional guide, and one thing that you hate as a guide, you can as a hunter, you can either make your guide better or you can make them worse. For and sure. By that is when you show trust and when you work with your guide, um, it really makes for a better experience for both of you. When you start questioning and doubting your guide and your guide starts making decisions based on that, then down. that guide oh, starts yeah. to break down. Yeah. It just yeah. Blows yeah. things plumb out of proportion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He loses a lot of his instincts, a lot of his gift. He's going to second guess himself just because of the confidence yeah. busted in the other person. But at the same time, I've also seen places and I'm fortunate, I work at a place with a lot of tremendous guides where I work at, but I've yeah. seen some places where it's hard to find guides and sometimes they put warm bodies out there. Mm -hmm. And and it's important for you to find that out. Yeah. And beforehand. And you no, know, th these are people that are, are a lot of time, especially if you're an archery hunter, because a lot of times it's easy to find rifle guides because they go out and they hunt during the rifle season and they do that, sure. but but they're not as effective as archery guides so yeah you know again like chav and gilbert said those questions that your profile what you're looking for because kyle i think part of the problem is you listen to our podcast man yeah. you listen to we hunt you listen to our <laughs> style yeah. right then you hire a guide and you go out there and he's chasing totally in opposite. the morning and the evening yeah i mean that's that's all he's doing and that's not our style so you know, you have to have those conversations ahead of time. And and, and you, that don't make it right or wrong. I mean, sure. you know, we right. don't know what the circumstances were, why the guy didn't want yeah. to uh, call. We have or, his own strategies or reasons yeah. for it. And, but, and, that, and it's an okay conversation to have as long as you approach it respectfully, right. you know, and say, you know, Mr. Guide, look, I, I don't know from Wild Honey about calling elk, but at the end of the day, I hired you as a guide and I need you to let me know, I mean, are we not calling because the elk ain't here or, I mean, we hear them bugling or, or they not, re you don't feel like they'll respond or are they beating us to location? I mean, there are all kinds of opportunities for you to. And it's almost 10 30 PM here in Texas. So we can start going on leash now. Joe. <laughs> no, I'm no. sorry, guys. Yeah, no, no, don't be sorry, Beto. That's, that's, a, that's <laughs> a real deal life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I went a little guy. I was there. like, uh, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was about to shoot. <laughs> so. Yeah. So I, like I said, I think you you can do it as long as it's respectful, brother. And yeah. you, you know, my grandpa said a long time ago, you catch more flies with honey than you ever will with vinegar. Absolutely. So you know, how you approach this deal with your guide, yeah. you know, is really on, on you. I mean, if you're aggravated and you're mad, probably not a good time to have that conversation. Let, let me quote a famous quote from a, a, a guide I knew very well that would tell somebody, Look, 
I cannot guarantee that you'll kill an elk, but I can sure guarantee you won't. And, and, <laughs> and that was something he would tell people that were acting like All butt heads, man. Mm-hmm. So and he didn't know, do butt heads. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> I, I think if I'm following a guy around the woods supposed to show me elk, the last thing I'm going to do is tick that dude off. So, uh, it, look, I hunted with Carl Gamage, and I must be straight honest with you. He didn't call very much. He had a little copper pipe in his in his pack, and then he had a, a, a diaphragm that he could use a little bit. But he was more of, we're going to hear him and sneak in there on him and, and get after their tail ends like that, right? That's what he was. And he would tell you straight up, I am no Joe Gilly. Joe Gilly will run through this country like a – you know, a wild banshee Indian with his hair on fire and calling screaming bugles and stuff like, I can't do that. That's not, that's not who I am, you know? Uh, but for me, I needed to know that I needed to know what my hunt was going to be like. And listen, when you dealt with Carl Gammon, you knew exactly where you stood and what he was not gonna, he was not going to tell you something you weren't going to get. I knew exactly what to expect when I came to camp and it was a lot of money. You know, I, people, you know, want to, I guarantee you that money you paid that guy, you worked your tail end off to get right. And I don't know what you ended up paying him, but at the end of the day, that guy, if he's any kind of guy worth his salt, worked his butt off, you know, to get, getting you up and down those mountains and trying to get you an opportunity. And as a guide myself, that's the only thing I can do is try to get you in an, into an opportunity where we Absolutely. can draw that bow back and let it rip, you know, uh, and if that happened, Kyle, you know, we don't know how your hunt turned out. Uh, but if that happened, man, um, good on, good on your guide, but have those conversations before you go on your hunt. Yep. Up next, Bob Rothrock, Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I was hunting in central Colorado, OTC public land on September 6th and experienced the following situation. I'm looking for advice on what I should have done. There was approximately a half hour to gray light. So this is in the morning. And I had a bull bugling heading up the mountain with cows. He was moving at a good pace, and continued to put distance between himself and me. I could estimate the closest he got to me was about 100, 150 yards, and then continued to extend the distance as he was heading up the mountain. Should you cow call, bugle, or just continue to follow? You answered your own question at the end there, brother. Yeah. Yeah. The, the only thing I would tell you. Slow, to, slow, try to slow him down. but You can. You, yeah, but you're not going to slow him down with a bugle. Hell no, because he'll he'll amp that up and get him. Yeah. Maybe he'll cow calls yeah. and cow calls and calves yeah. and maybe he'll lost get cows. Rolling, dude. Maybe a lost cow. But what you may do is call a satellite off of that with a lost cow. Well, which is fine too. But yeah, yeah. you know, and that's what so what you got to think of, of doing is slowing down the herd. And a lot of people don't talk about calling to do this. And you can slow down the herd you know, by using some of those buzz calls with the lost calf sound, you know, with the lost cow sound, you know? Yeah. And then sound like a herd back there that's, that's trying to, or even some regathering noises so that you stop them up. Yeah. You get those pleading cow noises out there so that you're not talking to the bull. You're talking to the herd. You're talking to the cows, slowing them up and quit and don't try to close the distance behind them up parallel paralleling them and wherever you're hearing that bull keep moving ahead of that bull yeah you're getting even with the herd because that bull's trailing back there most of the time make sure your wind is not up your tail end when you go to making a move on on the downwind side (laughs) down thermal yep absolutely and joe that sounds this sounds very familiar to um your bull last year yeah and we were actually trying to go up the ridge paralleling them and trying to slow them down and if you're going to try to chase him down son you better be you better be a guy that can get a 5k in i'll tell you that straight up because when they start going up they're unbelievable athletes and uh for me it's just better for me to take my time get around the side of him and And the elk 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 are also unbelievable athletes oh my god absolutely well and let me tell you what happens though too like and uh, RC just pointed out that close he got was 100, 150 yards. That's and close. what happens a lot of time with that, especially if you're coming up behind them and that bull stops at 100, 150 yards. When he stops and he's communicating with you, guess what his cows are doing? 
They're moving up the hill. Rolling. Yeah. And so he stopped while they're moving up and he's talking to you. And then he turns around. He does this little jog, man. Do, 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 do. And it sounds like they are sprinting away from you. But really, he's just keeping up with his cows. So that's why it's critical to try to get on his parallel side when you're doing that. And I, I have also used display bugle short roundups to try to actually stop the cows and pull them my way a little bit or get that bull kind of ticked off thinking that I was talking to his cows instead of challenging him. So again, I that's, do a, that's that, the thing you don't want challenging, right? If you challenge him, he's going to roll them up even harder. Absolutely. I want to communicate with the cows. I, right. mm -hmm. I forget about him, man. And, mm -hmm. and if he's going to stop and bugle hundred hundred fifty 150 yards, I'm moving up to the, I'm trying to get on the same level as him, level. not a little mm -hmm. in, in front of him. Okay. So, mm -hmm. That's, that's just something for you to think about. You got to keep moving. You, you're you like, okay, he stopped. He stopped at 100 yards. I can hear him. You should have been yeah. covering another 50 to 100 by then. Yeah, you, you should know. be moving off to Past that – to that side on that parallel side because it it's a it's a fantasy man it's a fantasy that that bull is going to stop he's got cows mm -hmm. moving up the hill and he's going to come back to me uh -uh. You know? my happening brother bob yeah L listen bob and if you if you bugled at that bull shame on you I mean, because he is now thinking he's got another bull in tow, thinking that, you know, oh, my gosh, especially if you challenged him. Oh, my gosh, the, the, this other bull fixing to come up here and carve him out a piece of my harem. That ain't happening. We're just going to push him as hard as we can go. And then it's going to be really hard for you to get up there with him, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, like Joe said, be quiet get around the side of him and dog him from the side parallel. And then once they get to their destination, which could be a long way away. It I might mean, be. RC, it how, might not be. How, far, right, how far are you seeing some of these bulls go to destination? I mean, they, they, a lot of them will travel three quarters to a mile or well, two miles. If, 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 if you're pressuring from the back or something ends up bumping them, they end up going over oh, a saddle yeah. into another one yeah. and up the yeah. next ridge, yeah. you know, right. but a lot of times these guys, man, they're, they they're, they're not trying to burn energy if they don't have right. to. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you get on that parallel side, man, and you just kind of chill, they'll get up to a spot and they'll get bedded down. Settle so, down. Yeah. yeah. Especially and, on a North facing slope. If you know, he's going up there anyway to get to some shade, yep. you know, you don't have to go real hard at all. You can stay. If you're within 150 yards of him, man, just put it in low gear and just kind of keep easing up to the right side of him and, before you know it, you'll be in his bedroom. So, Chris, Chris Vogel, you're up next from Atlanta, Georgia, but we're saving you, bro, for our next show. Um, we've been through a lot of conversations tonight. We've covered a lot of various guys, man. Good job tonight. I, this was fun. This absolutely. Was fun. I absolutely enjoy all the all the questions for sure. And, you know? and, and look, if our listeners keep rolling these questions in, we can do more of these sessions like this, where we just go hit one after the other. And it, it's a lot of fun for us. It, it gives us a little challenge, gives everybody a little variety. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I enjoyed that, man. Yeah, me too, Joe. And uh, we'll talk a little offline, but I might, might be fun to do one of these, uh, live on YouTube, yeah. man, and have some of our listeners. Oh no, man. Some of our listeners call live. in, man. Oh. No. Call in. I, oh my god, these guys love live, yeah. man. And I'm like, yeah. dude, I never know what's going to come out of Manano. <laughs> the last time he, the last time we were in a live show, he was sweating. <laughs> <laughs> he was. He was visibly sweating. RC, you had to yeah. give him a, a crying rag yeah. over there. Yeah. It wasn't. <laughs> the middle of the winter Thank God for was seven sweaty. seconds delays yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right Guys, we'll close this out it's man. fantastic content tonight man so good to see all of my, my elk brothers for sure if you like what we're doing listener please subscribe rate and review you got to go to apple podcast or apple itunes to uh review us and you can check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com and just a reminder, if any of our listeners would like their questions answered on the show, please send your questions to info at elkbros.com. That's info at elkbros.com. Like we say here in the Lone Star State, husbands, kiss your wives, wives, kiss your husbands, hug your babies, keep your broad head sharp and your powder dry. And we'll see you next week right here on Blue Collar Elk Hunting.
And you know what's up, man. You know what's coming next. Incredible music from our brother. Him and his brother tagged out in Washington this year. He walks the talk, man. Mr. Tony Wintrip closing out the show. Peace, peace, everybody. Well, I met her down at Tombstone Willie's with all the guys inside. Staring down a long, blonde girl with baby blue loving eyes. I told her if she was thirsty, she could put one of them on my tab. Then she said, no thanks, I'm a farmer's daughter. I'll use the money I have. Cause I wasn't born to run, I'm not a son of a gun. I work for everything I got. If you think that you're gonna smooth me over, Oh, I'm thinking probably not You're gonna have to show me those boots And that cowboy smile And show me that your short box lifted up Chevy out back And then, boy, we'll sit down and we'll talk a while Yeah, we'll sit down and we'll talk a while Let me hear your back crown run around Everything held up inside And if you like both seats Or Alabama every night And tell me, do you know those tides When those razor clams show And do you rope and do you ride Or boy, do you gotta go Cause I wasn't born to run I'm not a son of a gun I work for everything I got And my daddy never raised me the wrong way I was born around a coffee pot You're gonna have to pay your dues And work overtime And have to stay at home Cause I'll be begging you, boy To love me every My daddy never raised me the wrong way I was born around a coffee pot You're gonna have to show me that ring With that big bright shine And a cross around your neck With a big old smile We'll sit down and we'll talk a while Yeah, we'll sit down and we'll talk a while We'll sit down and we'll talk a while That cross around your neck With the big old